Now turning to our series on women's suffrage in New York. Last week, we told you about what happened before women won the right to vote in the U.S. This week, we're looking at what happened right after. Masara Makati has the story. The story of women and the vote continued in the early 1900s with a new generation of activists. Most of the original leaders of the movement, like Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, were gone. Through petition campaigns and marches, new leaders carried on the fight. The issue of race, so much a part of the early suffrage movement, continued. At the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., the well-known black leader Ida B. Wells and her delegation were forced to march at the back. In spite of the tension, neither black nor white women suffragists gave up the fight. Two years later, at the state capitol in Albany, a referendum on suffrage for women failed to pass. On the national scene, in 1917, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns led the silent sentinels who picketed outside the White House, arguing for a federal suffrage amendment. The response was brutal. Paul and Burns were arrested and tortured, but they never wavered in their commitment. Everywhere we look in this period, Everything was about suffrage, more and more and more. And the, the layers of activism and the layers of leadership, the layers of work that's happening uh, at every stage, rural as well as urban. If, if you didn't have an opinion on suffrage, you were probably dead. It was that prevalent in this period. In New York, the suffragist determination paid off. Nearly 70 years after the Seneca Falls Women's Right Convention in 1917, New York State women won the right to vote. New York suffragists celebrated, but there was still work to be done. A federal voting rights amendment had languished in Congress for more than 25 years. It took another two years for the women's suffrage amendment to pass both houses of Congress. In August 1920, the 19th Amendment guaranteeing women the constitutional right to vote in the United States took effect. The impact of the voting power of women was widely discussed. There were heightened expectations around achieving the vote. Some argue that too much was expected to happen too quickly in all areas for women, that they would vote in large numbers as a block, that they would succeed thereby in securing important issues for women, that large numbers of women would enter politics and win office. Women voted, but they were like any new group entering the, uh, the voting arena, they were slow to use it. Some New York women didn't hesitate to get involved. Women joined both the Democratic and Republican parties. Rhoda Fox Graves, a Republican from upstate New York, was elected to the state legislature in 1925. Rhoda Fox Graves was the first woman in New York State to have a fully fleshed out political career as an elected legislator. And it was a career that she controlled. So in that sense, she's atypical. She set her own career path and achieved it. In other ways, she's very representative of the first several decades of women in New York State politics. Rhoda Fox Graves was a skilled and conscientious legislator. Graves served as a New York State Assemblywoman, then Senator, from 1925 to 1948. She was a champion of rural causes and challenged the rise of corporate agricultural conglomerates. She challenged the Republican establishment that was largely either silent or tacitly supportive of these conglomerates. And she made a name for herself and she was beloved by her constituency for doing this. 
In the 1920s and 30s, the Democratic Party had won favor among black voters, which had generally supported the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, since the Civil War. In response, the Republican Party ran two black women for the New York State Legislature, Eunice Carter in 1934 and Jane Bolin in 1936. Both women lost. The Great Depression, World War II, and the Cold War shaped women's civic lives. There was pressure on women to exercise their civic duty by maintaining a strong home, supporting their husbands, and raising patriotic sons. It was a period of relative calm, but by the end of the 1950s, things started to change. A new generation of leaders emerged, suspicious of convention and ready for the next decade. And again, the younger women imbued with the activism of the early 60s jump up, seize the mantle, and move forward. And we get the emergence of an organized women's movement. There is a cohort of them who are energized by the activism of the 1960s in all its manifestations, civil rights, women's rights, anti-war movement, eventually gay and lesbian rights. They see themselves as change agents. They look to government as the mechanism for rapid change. The 60s is very much an era where rapidity of change is expected. In the 1960s, women became more active in politics and demanded more active participation. The days of stuffing envelopes and hosting lunches for candidates' wives gave way to running for elected office in bare knuckles politics. In Brooklyn, the daughter of Jamaican immigrants started her climb up the ranks of the Democratic Party machine. Shirley Chisholm would surprise many men and women in New York and the country. Join us for part three next week on New York Now.